thank you for having he, me here. Um, I, they, I'm not used to sitting. I'm a teacher, so I'm always used to stand, sta standing. You are standing. Yeah, I'm, I'm a teacher, so okay. I'm used to standing. Uh, if you don't mind, and if you can turn that camera this way, I guess that's. Um, I, I came to tell you. I, first of all, I didn't go to Morehouse College, so everybody can be relieved of that. And I spent a lot of time uh, tracking and chasing down Dr. Mays' papers, which are kept at Howard University. Uh, they're not kept at uh, Morehouse. And, um, uh, and I want to tell you why I, how and why I began this project. Uh, because in many ways, in some ways, my life uh, parallels uh, uh, and follows uh, uh, Dr. Mays. Not in the sense I didn't grow up rural. I grew up very, very urban, um, but um, I just want to give you some ideas of, you know, uh, most people always want to know, well, what brought you to this topic? And so most history writing, and I don't care who it is, even if you're writing about a thousand years ago in the Romans, you're asking a question about yourself. Really, that's what people are really asking. Most history is about the, the, the present moment, not the past. And much of my writing took place because I grew up in New Orleans, and I grew up in New Orleans till I was 14, uh, and um, the, the Civil Rights uh, Movement was uh, in, in my background. I was born in uh, 1956, uh, just as the, the movement um, uh, for civil rights blossoms on the national scene. It becomes a national movement. And in my community and in my uh, conversation, my two years, my senior year, it was um, a woman uh, named Ruby Bridges. Uh, and it, Ruby Bridges is famous. It's a famous painting of her by Norman Rockwell for a little six-year-old being escorted by marshals to go to school, to integrate schools. And I can still recall all the fuzzy background details, the adult discussions about Federal officers escorting a child to school just as armed soldiers had escorted teenagers to high school in Little Rock three years before. And this was the rival conversation to the election of John F. Kennedy. And, and now, and only in hindsight that I recognize that we sat in the, the balcony for the first time I ever went to see a full length movie. We sat in the balcony, The Music Man. It wasn't just fun, as my mother told me then, and it was still long. So I remember also the kind of uh, 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 parental vitriol as the school right around the corner, a stone stroke, you could hop a fence and I could go to it, was integrated. And white parents shouting, two, four, six, eight, we don't want a nigger grade. And I re recollect all the adult whispers because in a certain era, people tried to protect children from all of the vitriol and the hatred. In them. But I can remember all the adult whispers as to why the best swimming pool, uptown New Orleans, the Audubon Park pool, uh, swimming pool shut down for six years of my childhood from 1963 until 69. The world was changing in front of my eyes. My wonder years, remember that old television show, my wonder years, uh, as a nostalgic, uh, nostalgic television show was uh, represented not by sort of this innocence, but by the civil rights movement and, and the struggles for democratic freedom. I also, like many black Southerners, grew up religious. But I wasn't Baptist, nor was I Pentecostal. Uh, I was an oddity. I grew up uh, of, uh, a black Lutheran. Um, you know, in New Orleans, there were all five black Lutheran churches at one time. All of us had schools in New Orleans. And so I thought all Lutherans as a child were black. Everybody was Lutheran was black. And, and of course, I was confused as a little boy, about seven years old. Was our church founded by Martin Luther King? Or, you know, because we were Lutherans. I had, my mother had to set me right now. She said, no, I don't think so. So here I was, tied in New Orleans. In addition to that, we were black Lutherans uh, in the city of New Orleans. And uh, we were the black Lutherans of New Orleans where children's 
Uh, we were the mission child of the, the Missouri Synod Lutheran Church. So we tried to conform to German rectitude, all those Germans who founded uh, that denomination uh, as converts, but uh, Africanity and Mardi Gras always seemed to interfere. We liked our bodies and other people's bodies and danced too, too much, as well as our music and parties. We were New Orleans people. So in addition, we could not embody the angst of, as I met other Lutherans years of, and all of the kind of angst that they had about guilt and sin, because we were from New Orleans. Nevertheless, my interactions and formation with the foundational leaders of what became Europe's Protestant Reformation was fortuitous. Because early on, I was thinking about, what is this? Now, when I learned to read, y'all got to get this, right? We had Luther's smaller catechism, which said you were nothing but a worm, and, and you know, the reader, see Dick run, 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 see Jane run, spot run. All of those kind of confluence came together. So I, as a kid, was already thinking about theology, and religion, and then I grew up in the Dry Street YMCA in New Orleans. And that's much like I just walked down Auburn Avenue today, the old Butler Y. All of those black wives where young people went, and certainly my parents sent me to the YMCA. And I grew up in that. And so happens that Benjamin Mays, or his friends always called him Benny, uh, was one of the wise great workers. He worked at the YMCA movement. So all of these things. And so it happened in 1969, shortly after Dr. King was assassinated, that my wife took a trip to Atlanta. And it was the first time I ever stayed in a hotel. It was a big deal. We had to sell candy, and we sold candy around so we could make this trip to Dr. King's gravesite. Now, obviously, it is not the, it was at the old cemetery where he initially was in the city. And it was just one year exactly after the assassination in his burial. And I didn't know anything about uh, Dr. Mays, but I had learned from my teachers about Dr. King. And of course, when Dr. King was assassinated, I'm a kid, riveted at the, the um, um, you know, back in the day, we didn't have all this fancy high tech stuff. I'm riveted by, you know, uh, a little stereo. You remember the little audio players? If some of y'all old enough, y'all to admit that the little stereo. And my teacher brought on these albums of Dr. King on the day after he was assassinated. And he said to us that we needed to learn this stuff. So all of these things sort of came together. And then in 1970, my mother was a very wise woman. She said, um, New Orleans will not get you an education. Uh, and in Louisiana, we used to say, thank God for Mississippi. And uh, when Mississippi was 50th in education, and Louisiana was 49th. And so we would always say, we always had somebody just ahead. We would always just say, thank God for Mississippi. My mother decided that it would be wise that we moved with the uncle up to Chicago. And I had no idea uh, what the University of Chicago was or what its status in the world was at that time. but. I lived about approximately two miles from the University of Chicago, and that's where Dr. Mays went to graduate school. And here I am, a teenager, with my friend, we would walk through Jackson Park to, to the uh, Museum of Science and Industry. Now, the, it looks like a young guy here, but you know, back in my day, for geeky guys, you know, and there are geeky black guys, uh, we used to go to the Museum of Science and Industry to try to pick up girls. Okay. <laughs> So we would go there, and then we started going off to the University of Chicago and to museums such as the Oriental Institute uh, in the University of Chicago, and I had no idea what this place stood for or what its significance was. I was just a curious kid walking down the street, and I had no idea that some years later, I'd be taking classes at Swift Hall, the University of Chicago Divinity School, exactly where Dr. Mays had taken the school classes. Only thing I was trying to do was sort of begin to follow the trajectory of Martin Luther King Jr. as I went to college. So one of the first books I read my freshman year in between rounds of 
card game known as Bid Whist was King Spent to Love. Um, and I was curious as I began to think about history as a major, why didn't people talk about black people's ideas as though black people didn't have ideas, you know? When I went to college, especially in the 70s, right? And I had been assigned to read people like Walt Whitman and James, William James and Henry James and all those Jameses from New England, but never much about, and Jonathan Edwards, but never much about black people's ideas. With the exception of maybe W.E.B. Du Bois' Souls of Black Folks or Frederick Douglass' Narrative of a Life of a Slave. It was as though when I went to college that there were no original thoughts among black Americans. So I was eager when I went to college uh, to take a black history course with a man named Harold Cruz at the University of Michigan, who had written in 1967 a famous book, and we all should read it sometime, called The Crisis of the Negro Intellectual. Now this is the first time I had saw a book with both the word Negro and intellectual in it. Remember that black people had ideas, and how they argued about ideas about art and history and culture. But the other thing is that that was only among a small subset of people. Black people argued about religion all the time. In my house, in, 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 in various ways, but nobody was talking about that. So I decided in my seminar with uh, Professor Cruz, to write a, a paper on Martin Luther King Jr. Cruz, in his raspy Virginia to Harlem accent, announced to our class, uh, Mr. Jokes is going to take up the subject of Negro preachers. He did not know how prescient his statement was. In writing about Dr. King at that time, in the 70s when I did, I discovered that most of the author, and even his lot of biographers, would solely focus on white intellectuals that King read while at Boston University and Crozier Seminary. It is though King had not read any black authors. I had an argument with someone about the President of the United States. Uh, um, he was writing, he's a prominent scholar, and he was like saying, well, you know, Mr. Obama read this person, that person. And I said, well, did Mr. Obama ever read any black authors? Uh, and, and this is the same repetition of things going on. It was as though, it, as though King had not read any black authors for that matter, had not known any, even though he went to Morehouse College. So here I, here I was, here I was, some years, um, in trying to figure, figure this out. And so I wrote my paper repeating and regurgitating what the other authors had said. Now, I wrote this paper about King because I was interested in joining the struggle for a more just society. I wanted to be democratically engaged in the process of a me making effective change for the lives of those I grew up around, both in both New Orleans and Chicago. And I was still listening to my elementary teachers, Mr. Price, and Mr. Hughes, and even my German white Lutheran pastor, Reverend Mueller. Those childhood influences continued to stir in me and stir in my psyche as I began to to read more and think more about what is the meaning of power and justice and so forth. So it was serendipitous that in 1978, I found a copy of Benjamin Mays' autobiography, Born to Rebel, while working at the original Borders bookstore, bookshop in Ann Arbor. There was one time, there was one Borders bookshop, and I'm proud to say I worked for them when they were only one, and now they're all out of business, right? And then and, and back in Ann Arbor, I did, I did not know, uh, once again, how Mage would shape my life and in how many ways I would follow his path, the path he set out for King and so many other young black men. In the spring of 1979, I decided I wanted to study theology and ethics. And I wanted to understand how black Americans thought about their own religious faith. And in college, I had read James Cone's Black Theology and Black Power, a Black Theology of Liberation and the God of the Oppressed, and written a paper about it. 
And I wanted to know and believe then uh, that religious people had a great deal to say about democratic order and freedom. Once again, when I was a theological student, besides James Cone, there were very little mentions of Benjamin Mays. So my story took me back to Chicago, back to a place called McCormick Theological Seminary, which sits on the campus of the University of Chicago, and is tied in with the University of Chicago, where I began to take classes. And like Mays, I got to travel. In my theological education, I first thing I did my first year was go to Eastern Europe. And I studied the Romanian Orthodox Church in 1980 when there was still a communist dictator named Ceausescu. Very interesting. And then I went to the Middle East and off to the World Council of Churches. And this is where, again, Benjamin Mays had done all these things, and I didn't know I was on that trajectory, but I was. And then I wanted to be a scholar. And of course, the first, one of the first kind of great sociological portraits of black people's religious faith was Benjamin Mays' 1930 book, 33 book called The Negro's Church. And then he followed that up with a book called The Negro's God in 1938. He was a theologian, a public intellectual. All those things, you know, uh, my friend Cornell West says he's a public intellectual. Benjamin Mays was a public intellectual before the term was coined. He was writing in papers, and everywhere he went in the world, he wrote about it in the newspaper. Black newspapers, Norfolk Journal and Guide, the Baltimore Afro-American, the Chicago Defendant. And for uh, almost 23 years, he wrote a weekly column in the Pittsburgh Courier, a black newspaper, a national newspaper, once a week. So all of these things, I didn't know I was following. So when I got to do my PhD work, I was taking another seminar. And that's what you do when you go to graduate school. Anybody goes to graduate school, you know you sit in more seminars than you care to. Some are really great. And my dissertation advisor had this wing on black professionals. She wanted to know about black professionals. So I wanted to write about the professionalization of black clergy. Who was trying to professionalize black clergy? And just like the film we saw before, when, when Harry Richardson is talking about ITC, Benjamin Mays becomes the dean of the Howard University School of Religion, as it's called, in 1935. And he stayed, I, I mean, in 1934. And he stays there for six years at the Howard School of Religion. And because he's trying to take black people's religion seriously, and not only is he trying to take it seriously, he's trying to do the same thing I was in my head as a youngster trying to understand, is how could that religion inform the struggle for justice? Because Benny Mays was born in 1894, two years before Plessy versus Ferguson, when the Supreme Court finally enshrines all those bad laws all those evil laws, all those evil practices that the South had been in, uh, putting in place since the late 1880s. The court finally rules on that. And in every way in the South, black people's lives are being terrorized, all right? Because once you enshrine separate laws for people, you can terrorize them. So by 1898, when he's four years old, he says the first thing he saw was a mob, He's no kidding. A mob destroyed, mob violence destroyed Wilmington, North Carolina, where there was a sizable black middle class. And the mob violence went all the way into those rural towns where he grew up, where it's called the Phoenix Ride. And so he saw his father terrorized. He and his father walking, and men riding up on horseback. He didn't tell you that fool in that film that he scares as a four year old and runs under a porch and hides, looking at his father being made to kowtow. That's a, a particular word that comes from uh, 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 um, 
uh, parts of Asia where if someone is great and powerful, you, you bend your head to the ground. And he was made to dance. And a four-year-old watching his father humiliate him. And Mays is a church-going kid like me. His mama makes him go to church. Thank God for your mamas, right? <clears throat> like my mama made me go to church and at Lutheran church at that. And she said, it'll be good for you someday. You'll, you'll appreciate it. Uh, I do now. And Mays, his mother made him go to church. And it is there that his imagination, his imagination about social justice comes out of. This is out of the, out of the, the sources of the Bible and all of those things, the Beatitudes. And so here I came back writing about how black clergy were going to be professionalized. And lo and behold, I come back to Benjamin Mays. Because by 1934, Mays is revamping Howard School of Religion to train what he believes is an insurgent group of black ministers. He wants to see black ministers who go out and do community work, social struggle, all of those things. That's what he is doing. And he sets the groundwork. And for six years, he's laying a foundation. And then Morehouse calls him to be president. Now, Mays is, one of the things is, I tell my students, uh, my graduate students who are under me, I say, don't ever write about a man uh, who lives to be almost 90 and who has tireless energy. Write about Tupac. <laughs> Died early, quick, boom. You know, you got a lot of recordings and listen. But Mays was, he tired me because he, you know, he retired from Morehouse. And then he went on to be school board president in Atlanta from 69 to 80. I was tired after then. Like, like dude, why don't you stop? You know, it's called retirement. It's tireless energy. And that was something he took all his days. It's immense. Writing columns, traveling, talking, and building a foundation around Morehouse, but not just Morehouse. This is where the power of him, because he wrote those columns, he was talking to people out in communities. And before Dr. King was known, everybody in the country knew many names. And I want to say this. He took up the issue of apartheid in the 30s. And he debated about apartheid in public forums in Cleveland in 1951, and in Evanston, uh, Illinois, at the World Council of Churches meeting in 1954. So apartheid was on his radio. So when we talk about this great Atlanta, what people ought to understand is that he wasn't just a great Atlanta. He was internationally known. He was widely respected. And of course, his most famous thing he did in 1937 is go to meet Mohandas Gandhi. He actually met Gandhi, and the Gandhi papers, there's the interview with Mays interviewing Gandhi for 90 minutes about violence. What does it mean, nonviolence? And of course, Mays comes back and writes in black newspapers, says, what do we have if we had an American Gandhi? So this all brings us to King. A 15-year-old boy who sits at the Mays' dinner table and meets Dorothy Hyde and A. Philip Randolph is already hearing a story. It's no coincidence that King would understand these things. And my argument in my book is that King is imitating Benny Mays. That, that the model, the principal model that he has, when he says, he says that, he says, Benjamin Mays was my spiritual and intellectual father. That is quite remarkable. Remarkable, remarkable. Because nobody had written a book about it. Now, what you do when you write a book about someone, I want to say this. You all biographers of anybody looks to see if people are lying. You go you start from the principle of distrust. You know, autobiographies tell you what they want to tell you. And biographies, you start from the principle, hmm. As I went through his life, 
He was an honest, he was an honest man about his life. And he was honest about everything but the death of his first wife. Because that was too painful. He had a first wife, and my speculation is she died in childbirth here in Atlanta. And it was something he just never brought up again. And there are pictures of him and her, and there's a deep silence there. And you can understand why. And then he marries his second wife, Sadie Gray Mays who becomes his lifelong partner for 43 years. But other than that, he's a pretty remarkable fellow. And of course, he gets overshadowed by Martin Luther King Jr. One last anecdote I want to share with you. 1954, Mays is asked to come to the Southern Historical Association meeting to debate the great Nobel Prize winning author for literature, William Faulkner. And William Faulkner liked his, he liked his bourbon. He liked bourbon a lot. Faulkner, when he wrote a chapter in all of his various novels, As I Lay Dying, he would, he would notch on his bourbon bottle after he did each chapter. And so he was known to come to a lecture being a little bit tipsy. So the Southern Historical Association grabbed a grad student and said, you have to keep him sober until this meeting is over. Now this is at the Peabody Hotel in Memphis, Tennessee, interesting enough. And they're going to debate the issues of Brown versus Board of Education. And to fill out the panel, they put a, a lawyer on the panel, a man by the name of Cecil Sims. Now May, this is a segregation time. Mays can't come in the front door of the Peabody. So he comes through the kitchen. All the black staff there, like, it's like, you know, he's like Joe Lewis, coming through the kitchen to debate the great William Paul. <coughs> At the end of the debate, and in between the debate, Mays gets five standing ovations. Now I'm a historian, I go to these meetings. It's hard to impress us because we think we know everything. Historians are like that. It is an area people, you know, we know we, we get to write about everybody. We just think we know everything. So it's hard to impress. So five standing ovations. Now, why you don't know that story? It's very simple. At the end of the debate in 1954, the New York Times reporter interviews Faulkner. Says nothing about Mays. Uh, says nothing at all about what went on. But the record who were there, and people who were there were still alive. And so Mays kind of got written out the story, even though, by all accounts, he stole the show. So the, the power, the magnitude of the man and his national presence was already widely, widely known. And one of the ways he funded Morehouse is to be a national figure. One of the reasons they wanted him as president of Morehouse is, one, he was the first Morehouse president with an earned PhD. It was the first. Secondly, it wasn't just any old PhD. It was from the University of Chicago. And in before World War II, the University of Chicago trained more black PhDs than any other institution. That's something they ought to be very proud of. Next to that is Columbia. So Mays went this whole circuit to become a national figure. You gotta remember the sojourn. Here's a kid, a tenant farmer's child, watching his father humiliate, and then rising to national promise. That's some kind of drive. That's some kind of hope. And early on in his career, he decides, I'm going to inspire young people. Young people to act, to think, and to move. And I want to close out with this. One of the things that I take in my life from me as a professor is that I am always in the business of inspiring my young people to be democratically engaged. 
inspiring them to live out their best hopes and their, their dreams. I teach at the University of Kansas, and there's a small percentage, only the state is like 2% black. It's got a whole history of black people in Kansas, though. And these little small towns, believe it or not, it's still. But most of my students are white. But I still take up Benny Mays' lesson that to inspire them to be the best, uh, to hope for the best, to as aspire, and to, to hopefully bring some kind of inner journey, whether you call that spirituality or whatever, to, uh, to, to match your education so that you might do something more than yourself. That's why I wrote this story. And that's why I spent a long time tracing down papers. And I want to give a shout out to you all at Auburn Avenue. When I began this journey, I started here. And I went to Morehouse, and then Howard, and a whole bunch of places. So uh, uh, when uh, the friends of Auburn Avenue Library are asking y'all for cash and cash donations, y'all give up the cash, you know, help them out. Uh, all of those institutions of uh, repositories of black life and culture are so very, very vitally important. You cannot tell your story without somebody preserving these materials. So I want to thank you all, and then I'm going to open this up for questions and whatever else you want to ask me. But I thank you for allowing me to come here. Thank you all for coming out on uh, Thursday night. I know y'all could have been at the club or whatever. <laughs> Not you, right? <laughs> this is Atlanta, right? All right. Thank you. Yes. <laughs>